Hello and welcome to Newswire. I'm Aiza Umar. Iran launched two separate attacks on two military bases in Iraq where U.S. troops were stationed. Now, over a dozen short-range surface-to-surface ballistic missiles were launched into phases at An al-Assad Air Base, west of Baghdad, and near Erbil Airport, both in Iraq. The announcement was made by the IRGC spokesman, General Ramazan Sharif. Let's take a listen to what he said. At 1.30 in the morning today, it was hit by several missiles. Their second base near Erbil was also hit at the same time. Any adverse military action by the U.S. will be met with an all-out war across the region. The Saudis, however, could take a different path. They could have total peace. Now, Iran's foreign minister Javad Zarif tweeted soon after on Wednesday that Iran had concluded its attacks on, Amer on American forces in Iraq. There you can see his tweet on your screens. And he also said that they did not seek escalation on war. Mr. Zarif has also said that Iran conducted the attacks in response to the killing of Major General Qasim Soleimani, a leader of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, who was killed in a U.S. airstrike in Baghdad last week. You, you can see from the, uh, your screens that these are images from the past three days of the huge crowds that Qasem Soleimani's funeral procession drew in different cities across Iran. Now, the only official reaction that we have seen from the White House since the attack was from the U.S. President Donald Trump, and he tweeted soon after the attack, all is well. Missiles launched from Iran at two military bases located in Iraq. Assessment of casualties and damage is taking place now. So far, so good. We have the most powerful and well-equipped military anywhere in the world by far. I will be making a statement tomorrow morning. And that tomorrow morning statement is uh, expected uh, by Wednesday morning in the U.S., However, the Iranian state television initially stated that at least 80 Americans were killed in these attacks with heavy damage to U.S. equipment, namely helicopters and other military equipment. Now, the report also added that none of the missiles were intercepted and that if Washington retaliates now, they have another 100 U.S. targets in the region that they have in sight. A U.S. official who was speaking to the Associate Press and news agency, however, said there have been very few casualties, if any, from these Iranian attacks. So far, we don't have any further reports coming from the White House or the Pentagon about uh, the number of casualties or civilians or U.S. troops hurt there. Now, Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, uh, in a speech today, has talked about the Iranian Revolution being a pivotal change for the country and the world, and Iranians should use those historical lessons of the revolution and use this to confront enemies of Iran. He talked about Qasem Soleimani, he talked about how he was a great warrior and a leader, and also that the presence of the U.S. in the region should and will come to an end. He also talked about the missile attack on these U.S. bases in Baghdad and saying that they were a slap in the U.S.'s face. Now, this is obviously a developing story, and we will be bringing you updates as we go along. But let's talk to our guests now to see what they make of the situation and what does it look like in terms of the way forward for the U.S. and Iran. Let me introduce who's joining us today. We have Professor Atifa Tohiani from the University of Tehran, and uh, she is also right now in Tehran. We also have with us Mr. Matthew Breiser, the former ambassador, joining us from Istanbul today. You're welcome to both of you. Uh, Professor Atif, if I can begin with you to get an assessment of the overall reaction from within Iran, because we saw th tens of thousands of people out on the streets uh, mourning uh, the, uh, during the funeral procession, the three-day mourning uh, that took place in Iran uh, that has just concluded on Tuesday. By some reports, there were 5 million out in uh, Tehran alone. But at the same time, while Qasem Soleimani was, you know, taken uh, not just as a revered figure, but also reviled, uh, we seem to have uh, gathered that there is, is there a unity here in terms of the protest against the U.S. strike itself. Um, yes, General Soleimani's funeral, funeral procession in Tehran held by approximately more than 5 million, more than maybe 7 million of people just in Tehran streets, 
Um, the U.S. government said no one in Iran will shed any tears for the death of um, General Soleimani. But these mm -hmm. millions of Iranians mm -hmm. flocking to the streets to honor and mourn him who otherwise, uh, it showed this lack of understanding of Iran by the United States. Previously, U.S. officials met the MKO, MKO, which is known as an evil group, terrorist group in Iran among people. It showed the U.S. lack of understanding of Iran and the region. Um, it showed that the unprofessional experts giving suggestion to the U.S. officials and also um, the unprofessional um, the, the, the Israeli right. lobbies who are getting right. some advice. But United Professor Atif, if you could comment on the fact that now that these airstrikes have taken place, uh, that uh, on uh, where U.S. troops were stationed in Iraq, what is the sentiment now? Is this has this somehow appeased the crowd in Iran? Um, in fact, it was um, an, an, an act of war. And if Iran hadn't responded, it will send a message to Trump that he can do anything he wish in the future and kill any Iranian official he wanted. You mm. just declared an act of war in, in, on Iran many years ago by putting the policy of containment on Iran. Um, Iran action was not for war. Iran knows that it will end to harsh situation in the region. Okay. This act was a self-defense in response to the declaration of war by U.S., and killing a high rank official. If Iran wanted a war, it had so many other options in the region because United States is present in every corner of Middle East. Um, in fact, United States right. presents in Middle East as a source of conflicts and its presence is unproductive, destructive, and unnecessary. You are, US should get out of this region. Right. So coming to you, Ambassador Abraza, can you tell us about how you read into uh, President Trump's tweet, uh, especially right after where he said that all is well? I think he was trying to be de-escalatory and uh, uh, surprisingly is responding in a measured sort of non-Trumpian way. Um, hopefully he is getting uh, good advice, as Professor was just saying, he so rarely receives. Um, I, uh, I, I actually think that the step taken by Iran is, is so fortunate in the way it was carried out, causing maybe causing no casualties, and that uh, Foreign Minister's response was also measured, de-escalatory, saying that you know we don't want war. Essentially, this was proportionate and over and finished. So, if you look at those facts it would be highly counterproductive for President Trump to uh, react in an escalatory way, meaning it would be against the U.S.'s own national interest, because that could lead to an escalatory uh, process, uh, leading to a war that I am certain neither Washington uh, nor Tehran wants. And, you know, if, if, if no party wants war, it's very difficult for there to be a war. And right. in the history of warfare, uh, as someone who studied a lot of history, I, I don't know of any example of a truly, fully accidental war when at least one party did not want that war. Neither party wants the war now, so I think we're right. on a better trajectory. But at the same time, we uh, something that the prof uh, pr Professor Atefe also touched on here, Iran could have used, you know, could have responded in a plethora, plethora of ways, especially with proxies, you know, it could have deliberately uh, escalated the situation by using its proxies, but what it, instead it's done, it's used its military to, it almost seems not only to just show its own population that, you know, that they are showing a, a retaliation, that they are, um, you know, uh, showing a response. But at the same time, we're seeing this uh, with the Iranian government uh, using missiles that are known to be high precision missiles. So if there are no casualties, and it would clearly be a message to the U.S. government, wouldn't it? Absolutely. That's the point, the point I'm trying to make. Yeah, the way that retaliatory strike was carried out was diplomatically brilliant. Uh, it sent a very clear message of restraint, of proportionality, and of the ability to inflict much greater harm. Uh, it is uh, an example of uh, clarity of diplomatic communication at really the highest level of quality. Uh, I, I'm quite impressed. And I, yeah, as you're saying, I can't believe that these highly precise uh, missiles simply failed to, to uh, hit any, anything that they were targeting and then by accident didn't cause any U.S. casualties. So I, I'm hoping, almost praying, that President Trump will appreciate these facts and when he wakes up and, uh, and not be in what is so often in his part a bad mood. Right. So, Professor Atafir, now having sort of, we're getting this assessment, uh, not just from what we've heard from Ambassador Breiza, but also generally analysts are talking about how even President Trump, who was about to give a address, was about to address the nation uh, on Tuesday night, 
had delayed that to Wednesday morning. Uh, it, does this show you the same trend that this that both parties, Iran and the U.S., are working towards de-escalation in the region? In fact, the status of the United States in the region has been shrinked. It is a turning point for the U.S. status in the region. Anti-Americanization um, sentiment in Middle East, for sure, would escalate. And also, um, uh, you, in, inside Iran, there is a consensus among uh, politicians and also experts that the United States has, Iran has to um, just um, respond to all the acts of the United States in this position. Um, I think that uh, Iran is not searching for war because this war is devastating. Um, it's not um, like any other war. It will. Um, it would be a continuous war. Um, uh, it's real destruction in the region and um, destabilize the region. It will cost thousands of um, lives in the region. Therefore, Iran is uh, trying to um, just um, try to respond in a way that it's not um, going to um, make a, a huge casualty in the United States. Um, therefore, that this the escalation take place maybe. So now, while this seems like the case that de-escalation efforts are being made, we've seen the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, we've seen the Defense Secretary, Mark Esper, both uh, talk about, uh, in, 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 in very clear words, that they want a diplomatic solution here. They're not looking for war. But is Washington united on this? We've seen U.S. Republican Lindsey Graham come out and say that this is exactly the kind of direct declaration of war that Iran has done. What do you feel? Do you think everybody's on board there or there are some war hawks out there who would be looking for the U.S. to respond? Yeah, there are always those, those sorts of hawks like Senator Graham here, people who talk tough and have never worn a uniform, never even imagined being in combat. Um, and so the reality is, though, that uh, the president, as, as peculiar as he may be, is in charge. And it really doesn't matter if Senator Graham or even people within you know, the, the president's innermost circle of advisors are highly hawkish. If he doesn't want there to be a war, it won't happen. I mean, there is great discipline uh, that the president himself lacks, but, but in, the, in the national security apparatus of the United States, having worked for four years at the White House, I, I know how disciplined it is. Um, so I, I don't think things are gonna spin out of control. Uh, and I think if President Trump really sits back and thinks, he realizes uh, what he just ordered, what he just did, has dealt the U.S. a strategic defeat. Right? War or military action is supposed to be the continuation of politics by other means. It's the pursuit of political goals. What are the U.S.'s two major strategic goals in the Trump administration with regard to Iran? One is convincing Iran to get back to the negotiating table so he, President Trump can take credit for a quote-unquote better nuclear agreement than President Obama was able to negotiate. And two, it's to constrain Iran's influence uh, in the Middle East and maybe even weaken the Iranian regime. Both of those things have now failed because now, as the professor was describing, anti-Americanism is so high in both Iran and Iraq, by the way, where the U.S. attack violated uh, Iraq's uh, uh, sovereignty, and you could argue as did the Iranian attack. Uh, but also, it has taken the wind out of the protest movements in both Iran and in Iraq, which were precisely against the government of Iran and Shiites in Iraq protesting the militias, the Iranian supported militias, the corruption and the role of Iran in Iraq. So the US was on course strategically until apparently Secretary of State Pompeo decided now is the time to win the argument he'd been making for months that killing Soleimani would be a good thing. And I think President Trump did it as a tactic without thinking through the strategic negative impact. And that, that's just bad policy. Now, very quickly also on the war powers that President Trump carries according to the U.S. Constitution. Could you shed some light on this? We've seen uh, many Democrats, including Nancy Pelosi, House Speaker of the Democrats, talk about criticizing uh, President Trump, not intimating or consulting the Congress before Soleimani's killing. In terms of historical precedent and the U.S. Constitution, shed some light what Trump, uh, President Trump can go ahead and do in terms of military action. 
Sure. Uh, under, under the U.S. Constitution, the president, of course, is the commander in chief of the military and is responsible for foreign policy. He can take into account the views of Congress if he wishes, but he's in charge of foreign policy. That said, there's a huge caveat. There was something called the War Powers Act, right, that was passed in the wake of the Vietnam War and the Watergate scandal in the mid 70s. And that says if the president is going to use offensive military force, essentially, and you know, get the U.S. into a war, uh, he has to consult with the Congress. And, and then a declaration of war comes from the U.S. Senate. So to get around that, the president is claiming this was an act of self-defense. It had to be done immediately. And to be honest, there's no clear constitutional solution. This is the sort of uh, dilemma that has to be resolved politically. And Professor Atifa, something that Senator Breiser just said earlier on that uh, the U.S. has essentially lost its strategic position here. It's backfired completely with not just Iran's anti-U.S. rhetoric, but also Iraq's uh, picking up here. In terms of the kind of pressure that the U.S. had been putting on Iran, do you agree with the assessment that there was even an opportunity for Iran to uh, sort of meet them halfway on the G JCPOA deal, the Iran nuclear deal, since uh, President Trump withdrew from 2018, the kind of strategies he's been employing on increasing pressure, increasing sanctions. What is your take on that? Um, I think that, that Iran didn't have any option uh, by the, the, the position of today because um, the United States made the situation so um, harsh to this position that Iran didn't have any um, other option. U.S. declared an act of war. In, in fact, U.S. declared an act of war many years ago by putting the policy of containment on Iran, a policy that blocks the nation to activate their potentials. In fact, the United States is responsible for so much fatalities in Iran because of sanctions uh, and medicine and airplane industry and many other parts. United States sanction is responsible for poverty in Iran and also corruption that was due to rounding sanctions and also um, the, the protests that happened in, um, in the previous um, the months. Um, Iran, in fact, um, is trying to um, trying to solve the problem in inside the Middle East by um, responding in such a um, not not a harsh way, not with less uh, fatalities. Um, but as you know, um, this anti-American uh, sentiment is not uh, non-stoppable uh, uh, in the Middle East because um, 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 American troops are uh, in danger, in a great danger in the Middle right. East. And if right. any casualty happens, as the United States is um, responsible, is um, direct responsible at this situation. All right, Professor Atifet Togiani, thank you so much. She was joining us there from Tehran. Um, coming back to you, Ambassador Braiza, this we've seen the, you talked about it also, that how the protesters in Iraq, they've uh, come out with, you know, their condemnation also. They're saying, take your war uh, elsewhere and don't, the, uh, regarding U.S. and Iran tensions, don't fight it on our soil. But also, we've seen the leadership condemn uh, the attack on Soleimani, saying it was a violation of their sovereignty. Now, with Iran's move of launching those more than a dozen missiles, uh, you know, in those two uh, military bases in Iraq, how, how do you expect them to be responding to that? That's a good question. Um, I think probably, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm no expert on the collective psychology of uh, Iraqi various uh, sectarian bits of society, but my guess is um, because the response by Iran was so measured, even though it was a violation of Iraq's sovereignty, my guess is the prevailing mood will be that the U.S. created this problem and Iran had no choice uh, but to react, but to react. What is utterly unclear, though, is what is actually happening with, among the protesters who are out there against Shiite militias, uh, against Soleimani uh, in, in, the, in the thousands, uh, and against Iran's influence in Iraq. Have they become anti-American, or is it just that there's such an overwhelming upswell now of anti-Americanism that they still are against Iran, but they're being overwhelmed and drowned out 
by all of the other Iraqis who are so angry at the United States for what it did. You know, it's not clear um, how Iraqi Kurds are going to react. They boycotted the parliamentary vote the other day that called for the U.S. troops to withdraw. And lo and behold, Erbil, their capital, was was one of the targets of this mm. uh, retaliatory strike. So there's so much still in play. And my guess is Iran's going to remain Iran. And at some point in the future, if President Trump doesn't overreact and continues this de-escalation, um, then I think you're going to see the anti-Iran sentiment grow again. Mm -hmm. uh, and if President Trump gets really wise and decides to offer sanctions relief in exchange for some sort of concessions on the JCPOA, I think finally that pressure could take hold with that additional carrot. We could see a new agreement, a new JCPOA, if you will. But that's you know, many, many months down the road. But still, one of the many scenarios that could unfold, and one hope that it would lean towards that instead of a full-on conflict. Here, let me welcome another voice uh, to this conversation. Mr. Samir Sejovic is a journalist. He's joining us right now from Tehran. Uh, Mr. Samir, give us an idea of what the sentiment is like right after these Iranian strikes uh, in uh, Iraq on U.S. Uh, bases. What is the reaction you're seeing on the streets? I think everybody's underestimating the, the Iranian people right now. From what I've seen, they are very united, especially even, even the people that don't support the government, quite frankly, the people that might have been protesting. They have the move by the United States to execute Qasem Soleimani has united the Iranians. And I've been here for almost a week now, and it's, the streets are packed with people. In Tehran, there was two to five million people. Uh, paying their respects to Qasem Soleimani. Yesterday, there was another two million at Karaman uh, in his birthplace. So I, I really, I'm listening to a lot of analysts from, from abroad. Um, that is not the feeling that I'm getting in the streets. They're talking about, you know, Iranians, uh, regular Iranians not supporting this. That is, I, I don't believe that is the case. I think uh, the, the move by the United States to take out or kill Qasem Soleimani in a third country, in a neighboring country of Iran in Iraq, uh, has definitely united all the uh, Iranian people here. And But uh, Mr. Whether... Samir, after these two strikes uh, in Erbil and in uh, the other military base, I mean, are there concerns? Is there any kind of sense of fear amongst the Iranians? Because they've already been facing a crushed economy uh, after those uh, one U.S. sanction after the other. I mean, they've been really suffering. Uh, and we saw the culmination of that in protests recently in Iran. So is there a fear that things might now just get worse? Because there's been quite a lull, a bit of a silence from the U.S. side uh, uh, in terms of a response to these attacks. I, I really am not getting that feeling healing here. I've spoken to the people in the streets and Many of them have told me that they will rather die in poverty than be humiliated by a tyrant state, which they consider the United States to be. Uh, I understand that people uh, seem to be thinking that these sanctions are working, and maybe they are working. But uh, right now, the, the, the situation on the ground is quite unified. Mm. And regular people, like I said before, uh, they, they're not really worried about the sanctions. And if you uh, keep in mind, Iran has been sanctioned by the U.S. for the past 30 years. People here are tired of listening to the United States. And uh, lately, I've heard people in the streets asking me because of my uh, American English, uh, American accent. They thought I was an American journalist. They were asking me, who is your country or your government to tell us how to live? And, uh, the, you know, after explaining to them that I'm not an American, they basically uh, were really open in talking to me and they told me that they don't accept any ultimatums anymore by the United States. They feel betrayed as the United States has pulled out of an internationally signed nuclear agreement. And that is how the Iranian people feel. They feel that you, the United States is not to be trusted anymore, especially after so much effort was put into uh, diplomatic corps to put this nuclear deal together. And if you go back a couple of, uh, actually two years ago, when Donald Trump scrapped the agreement, it was European Union uh, countries that also uh, basically called upon the United States to return to the agreement. So mm -hmm. just imagine the, the, the circumstance of, the circumstances of things if Iran chose uh, to pull out of the uh, nuclear agreement, where would we be then if that right. would have happened? Unfortunately, the United States has pulled out of this agreement. It has decided to go with further sanctions. 
And I think the, the Iranians lived under sanctions for so long that they've become masters of avoiding sanctions. Right. So coming back to uh, Ambassador Bryza on this also, uh, the JCPOA, the whole debate there was that President Trump's typical tactic is to pressurize, to walk away right before making a deal. But the question really is, was there even that option? But more than that, considering how that unfolded, especially in the past few months, how do you assess the reaction we are seeing from U.S. allies, do you, this, especially after the killing of Soleimani and now with the Iran uh, re response? Well, first of all, um, on the JCPOA, um, you know, President Trump for months has been, had been uh, trying to get a meeting with President Rouhani. And Emmanuel Macron, the president of France, was trying to broker such a, such a meeting this summer. And uh, President Rouhani said all the way through, I'm not going to sit down and talk unless or until you provide us some sanctions relief. So there's your clue, President Trump. <laughs> Offer some sanctions relief. Soften the maximal pressure like, like anyone. Uh, President Rouhani is not, not going to want to come to the negotiating table under duress. So you have to entice him. Um, that's utterly impossible to conceive of now, but you know, let's let's pick that question up again in a couple of months, depending on how President Trump reacts when he wakes up today. Um, a story that we should discuss is definitely the second one that you just raised: the uh, U.S. allies' response. It is it is unimaginable to me, after my 23 years in, in U.S. diplomacy, that any U.S. president would contemplate a such a bold, radical, even reckless step as the murder of. Of General Soleimani, uh, who, who was a terrible person in my book, and knowing the things he was planning, including against my own colleagues and myself, uh, but without consulting your allies. In principle, the consultation should have happened. In practice, there are allied troops on the ground with U.S. troops. Uh, how can you not at least give them warning that you're going to do something that could lead to them being in harm's way? And I think for now, the NATO allies are, are maintaining solidarity with the U.S. Uh, they are criticizing the retaliatory strike uh, by Iran, but only half-heartedly. They're mm. calling on President Trump to show restraint. And I think this is yet another right. major step by President Trump that is burning through the, the, the dwindling trust and sense of transatlantic solidarity that's still there, at least on the European yeah. side, mm. but that President well, Trump doesn't seem to care about. Doesn't seem to care about. Mr. Samir, take on this. You have, has the U.S. put not only itself, but its allies also in the and their interests in its war path? Well, all, with all due res respect to the former ambassador, um, I understand that uh, he's raised one good point. You know, the, 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 the Rouhani has asked Donald Trump, OK, if I'm going to sit down at the table, if I get some concessions in terms of sanctions, but that's not going to happen. You know, these the, the nuclear uh, deal signed by both sides was worked on for so long by the Obama administration, by John Kerry. A lot of effort was put into this, a lot of finances uh, by NATO allies. By And I understand that uh, also that uh, Qasem Soleimani posed a threat to a lot of American lives in the Middle East. But we have a president in the White House who, just like the ambassador, former ambassador said, he makes decisions based on what type of mood he's in in the morning. And this decision, which uh, he, they made to execute the, the Qasem Soleimani, uh, my question is, what would have happened if the Iranians or the Iranian militias in the Middle East decided to take out the director of the CIA? Would the United States consider that uh, an act of war? Of course it would. So that uh, that is vice versa here right now. So right. I really don't think that this motion and this uh, action was really thought through well. Mm. It doesn't suit American interests, definitely. And, uh, and, and as I, you we know, are seeing, I, I fully as understand the concerns. Right. And we continue to see their allies reacting in other countries, uh, Germany, Croatia, Canada. They've already started moving troops out of Iraq. Philippines is evacuating its citizens. NATO has announced that it's withdrawing and suspending training there in Iraq. So they have some around 500 soldiers present. Now, with that, we've um, run out of time. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Bryza and Mr. Samir. We're going to take a quick short break here. We'll be back with our second story. Welcome back to Newswire. I'm Aiza Umar. Now, Russian President Vladimir Putin, he's arrived in Turkey on Tuesday to attend the inauguration ceremony of Turkstream, a project which will deliver Russian gas to Turkey and Europe. 
Now, a lot is being expected uh, from this meets meeting because President Putin's meeting with President Erdogan is coming at a time where major developments have taken place in the Middle East. But at the same time, what we're expecting is that while Iran has supported Bashar al-Assad in Syria, which also enjoys the backing of Russia, President Erdogan and uh, President Putin, they don't see eye to eye on Syria. And the Turkish leader has been really unhappy about the Syrian army's drive into Idlib and that uh, creating a mass exodus of refugees headed towards Turkey. So all of this and more we will be discussing with our guests that we introduce, who's joining us today. We have, uh, with us today, Mr. Turan Ghaffarali. He is a researcher with a TRT World, and he'll be talking to us uh, from Istanbul. And we have Mr. Andrei Kortunov, an analyst and director general of the Russian International Affairs Council. He's joining us from Moscow. I want to start with you, Mr. Ghaffar Ali, on your assessment of how you see the uh, if how, how you see this meeting unfolding between the two presidents of Turkey and Russia. Thank you very much for inviting me first, first of all. And I would like to start with the Turkstream project. Turkstream project is not a new project, and it's been proposed by the Putin uh, years uh, ago. So. Uh, as you mentioned, it can be obviously like contributing to Turkey and Russia relations. However, it will not change the stance in Libya or in Syria, in my opinion, because uh, those uh, agreements are completely independent from the Turkish-Russian relationships. As we can see in military agreements, Turkey and Russia is very close now uh, with the purchase of S-400s and the new deployments next year and this year as well. There will be a multiple uh, cooperation in the economic sector and tourism is also booming as the tourists are continuing to come from Russia. So no matter what will happen in Syria and in Libya, Turkey and Russia will continue their uh, uh, cooperation in between themselves. Uh, obviously, uh, there is uh, misunderstandings and uh, the other parties are involving in Turkish-Russian relationships, mentioning especially the USA. However, I think Erdogan and Putin will speak uh, prominently on the Syria and uh, Libya and finally propose something that will contribute to the peace in the end. So you think the, the Turk, that's an understood thing that the Turk Stream project has been going on for a while now, but besides it helping Turkey to meet its own demand, its own energy needs. It will also obviously help both countries to achieve their common objective of not just sort of exploiting their geopolitical position and becoming, besides a major energy hub between the East and West, but also sort of asserting the kind of role they have been playing in the region. Mr. Kortunov, how do you see this? Can you see Turkey and Russia getting on the same page when it comes to Syria and Libya uh, at the back of the Turk Stream project? Well, I think that uh, these are very complex uh, problems, and uh, there are definitely there are differences in uh, how uh, both uh, the Syrian and the Libyan problems are looked at uh, from uh, Moscow and from Ankara. As far as uh, Syria is concerned, I think uh, there are two potential points uh, of contention there. Uh, on the one hand, uh, indeed, there is a question of Idlib. And uh, I bet uh, that uh, Mr. Putin receives a lot of pressure from uh, Mr. Bashar Assad, uh, who wants uh, to grab uh, this uh, remaining piece of real estate, uh, because uh, in the end of the day, Russia stands uh, for the territorial integrity of Syria. And uh, definitely the question of Idlib is uh, not uh, if, but rather when uh, this territory might get back under the control of Damascus. But uh, there is also the issue of northeast. And I think that um, many in Ankara might feel unhappy uh, about uh, Russia not uh, not pushing the the Kurds strong enough uh, to make sure that uh, the objectives of the of the Turkish operation in the northeast uh, are, are really completed. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, this is an issue, and uh, definitely uh, these uh, contradictions are not irreconcilable. Uh, there are ways to bridge the gap between uh, the Russian and the Turkish position, and uh, I think that the two leaders are doing exactly this thing in Istanbul right now. Mm -hmm. As far as uh, Libya is concerned, I think, uh, indeed, the situation there is probably even more volatile. We don't know exactly what kind of uh, engagement uh, uh, Turkey is ready uh, to go for in Libya. But uh, in case of Libya, I would slightly disagree with your assessment. I don't think that... Uh, now, Russia supports Haftar uh, against uh, the, the government in Tripoli. I think that uh, Russia would like to avoid uh, 
taking sides in the conflict and uh, would like to enjoy good relations with both sides. Well, I understand why you say that, but it is an understanding that even if it's the Wagner footprint there, a, a sort of a independent uh, um, uh, arms uh, and security providing company, it is associated closely with the Kremlin. I mean, there's no denying that for sure. Well, you know, we know that uh, Russia provides uh, arms and uh, uh, provides uh, uh, technical assistance uh, uh, to the government uh, in uh, West uh, Libya. And as far as arms uh, contracts are concerned, at least the official Russian position is that um, these are private initiatives and the Russian government cannot take responsibility for them. Okay, well, Mr. Gaffar Ali, let's get your take on this. Let's obviously be part of this meeting's discussion between President Putin and President Erdogan. Do you think there is a possibility that President Erdogan will agree to uh, a condition that Turkish soldiers will not engage in combat in Libya, considering the kind of alliances both have in the country? Uh, the situation in Libya uh, from the Turkish side, we need to first understand that well, how Libya is important for Turkey. Libya has recently signed a maritime delimination agreement with the Turkey. So uh, this uh, agreement in the East Mediterranean will open the door for the Turkey to continue its search and exploitation in the East Mediterranean. And it will also secure the illegal demands that was made by the Cyprus and the Greece. So Libya and Turkey is now bind by each other, not just by the conflict going in Libya, but also in East Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. Therefore, Turkish support to Libya is not just by provided by Turkish authorities. Libya, which is like uh, Mr. Al Sarraj, is officially recognized by the UN government. So UN supported government asks for the help from Ankara, and Ankara provides it. In current phase, as the President Erdogan said yesterday, Turkey only sent 35 soldiers, special forces. Uh, but in continuation, obviously, as the Khalifa Haftar stands on the doors of the Tripoli, Turkey will continue to send its forces to support on the ground forces. But I think Turkey's and Russia's relations over Libya is slightly different from Syria. In Syria, there are two, uh, there are two major players, but in Libya, there are other factors as well. Egypt, UIA, or uh, the Germany is main facilitator in uh, Libya. So mm. Turkey and Russia will definitely play a long play together. They both want to end this with a peace. Mm. However, I don't think that Turkey and Russia will be such active as in Syria in Libya. Obviously, there are sides. Turkey supports mm. the Tripoli government. But uh, the uh, recent development shows that Turkey will not uh, back on the sending troops to Libya for sure. Okay, but then so how do you see the Syria story conflict developing over there? I mean, there in Idlib as the offensive in the past few weeks by the Damascus regime, which is obviously backed by Russia, it continues. Uh, there are concerns that that uh, peace agreement that was agreed by both countries is now uh, and resulted in uh, those 12 observatory uh, uh, posts of Turkey's in uh, Idlib region, that that is on very shaky ground now. Do you, do you, what are your key takeaways, especially considering the meeting just took place with Bashar al-Assad and uh, President Putin yesterday? I agree with, I agree with Mr. Mr. Kortunov on the thing that uh, Mr. Putin can be under pressure from Bashar al-Assad to, to protect uh, the uh, provinces that gained from Idlib. However, I think the main Russia's concern is the bombs that falling from uh, Idlib to Latakia, the air base that uh, Russian controls. Therefore, I think Russia has also personal interest, considering that Bashar al-Assad is also pressing, but Mr. Putin is also thinking to regain the Idlib back. However, the Sochi agreement is still not in the place. Mm. Uh, whether like Turkey and Russia having like a uh, common uh, military presence in the Idlib, still right. Turkey's two points out of 12 is encircled as the uh, regime forces are advancing towards the Idlib. So right. Turkey is uh, two points now and under encirclement. And mm. Turkey, I don't think they will back up until the final peace agreement will be done, which will protect the forces that Turkey backs up. And Turkey is very angry on the issue that the uh, Assad regime sells uh, to all forces to drop their weapons and considering terrorists, everyone terrorists, rather mm. than the uh, Assad's uh, own army. So Turkey first wants to recognition of the opposition and then to sit on the table and depend on the fate of Idlib to, to solve the whole northeastern Syrian issue. Ms. Kortunov, Mr. Kov, we're running out of time. Your last 30 seconds, if I could get your closing comments on what our guest just said, but also in terms of the solution needed for the Idlib crisis, these talks with Syria, in Syria with President Putin and Bashar al-Assad and now with President Erdogan also, they need to revolve around how they're going to deal with not just uh, northwestern Idlib province, but also what's happening in the northeast. How do you see this moving forward? 
Well, I think that, uh, you know, they, they can uh, play it pretty well uh, in case of Idlib, uh, Russia uh, should be the bad corp. The bad corp and Turkey, the good corp, uh, potential uh, danger of uh, Russian assistance uh, to, uh, uh, to Bashar Assad might give uh, Turkey additional leverage in dealing with the opposition in Idlib. But in the, south, in the northeast, I think it's the other way around. Uh, uh, Turkey might uh, be the bad corp and Russia might have stronger leverage in dealing with Kurds. If they do it right, it might work. It will be delicate. It will be difficult. But I don't think it's impossible. You don't think it's impossible and one can hope for that to see in the future some peace in Syria and also what is unfolding in Libya. Well, we've run out of time there. Thank you so much, Mr. Kortanov and Mr. Gaffer Ali, for joining us here on Newswire as we discussed Iran in the future of Syria and Libya's conflict. We've come to the end of the program. We will be seeing you next week with more news and analysis coming from Newswire. Till then, goodbye.